we are on camera. Uh, today's November the 7th, 2019. My name is Roger Soyset. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center, and with me is Tony Hilliard, also a volunteer at the center, and Sue Verhoff, Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the Atlanta History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. David Wallace, who served in the U.S. Navy during Vietnam. Mr. Wallace's oral history is being recorded for the Atlanta History Center's Veterans History Project in partnership with the Library of Congress. We're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Wallace, and thank you for participating in the project. To begin with, would you please state your full name and date of birth? David Wallace, uh, March 27th, 1946. And where was that? Youngstown, Ohio. Ah, a Yankee. <laughs> hmm. Well, sir, uh, let's talk a little bit about your days before service and uh, find out what brought you to Atlanta. Well, I, I came of age uh, as a U.S. steel brat, which meant that we went wherever there was a steel mill, uh, Pittsburgh, Youngstown, Cleveland, Chicago, all those places. But all through my high school years, strangely enough, I stayed in Pittsburgh. And this was in the uh, 60s, started high school in the early 60s and finished in 64. Uh, and that was during the period when Vietnam was sort of kind of get going. Uh, and it was a war and nobody much thought much of it and people were, were everybody was you know, like, where's Vietnam? And then as I got into college, I had a deferment, of course, uh, being a, a rich, uh, I guess, guy from the suburbs or something. But uh, as you work toward your degree in college, you realize something was going to have to give here. Uh, there were people being killed, uh, fraternity brothers who'd graduated years earlier uh, were coming home without all their parts and some were being killed. And, uh, so I guess it was toward the end of my junior year I went down to the Navy recruiter and said, gee, I'd like to sign up and be one of those Navy officers. You know, pretty, pretty good looking uniforms, you get a sword, all that good stuff. So got it on a delayed entry ended up graduating from college in 68, uh, went to OCS that summer, and it was a, a strange experience for, for two reasons. First of all, we went and our instructors, upperclassmen uh, at OCS, were all ex-Navy chiefs and warrant officers. Uh, that was a little tougher than we had sort of planned. The other, the other thing that made it really surreal was I started in August. All right, August, as you may know, in Newport, Rhode Island is when the Jazz Festival takes place. We could literally sit in our room at night being quiet and sitting at the prescribed angle and doing our homework with the prescribed pencil held at the right angle uh, and listen to Joan Baez singing over the, over the walls. Uh, at any rate, went, uh, made it through that experience, got my commission, uh, was assigned to a, an attack cargo ship, which isn't really that dramatic. It's a big old victory hull and had some great people on it. Uh, as soon as I got there, the XO called me in, and he was a super guy, ended up being a friend that I stayed in touch with for years and years. Uh, but he said, uh, here's, here's the good news, we're assigning you to this. Uh, second piece of good news, you know, that's gonna be your job. This is gonna be the guy you're gonna hang on to. And he called into this little squawk box on his desk and said, send chips in. Uh-oh, what have I done already? And this old, and it turned out nobody knew how old Chips really was. Uh, they think he was in the Navy for 43 years. They think. 
Now, I know he told me he had enlisted when he was 16. But he was a, a warrant officer, commissioned warrant officer, and he probably knew more than anyone I've ever met about almost everything. I learned more about handling people and how to, how to do things from chips than I've ever learned any time of my life. So that was the really great thing. Third thing, EXO says they're going to decommission this ship in about five, six months. And I went, well, why am I here, sir? And he said, uh, you know, infinite knowledge of Bureau of Naval Personnel. Uh, and I said, okay. And he said, what, what do you think you want to do? And I said, well, I tried to volunteer for swift boats right out of OCS, but they had had a program where they were taking ensigns, but they closed it off because of some not so great results. Uh, and I, that's what I'd really like to do. And he said, well, and he had checked that out for some reason. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, he said, you need to get your <clears throat> officer of the deck qualifications <clears throat> to do that. And so I said, fine, how do I do that if, you know, we're welded to the pier here? And he said, I'm going to get you on some other ships. And uh, if, even if you don't get the full qualification, you will have that experience. And that, with my recommendation, will be enough to get you into the Swift Boat program. Oh, sure. Uh, so I went off for a couple months on some other ships and worked with different people and had... Here we go. Tony didn't get a chance to warn you, Roger. I can talk for hours. Uh, had one of the most unique experiences anyone in the Navy will ever have. In the wardroom, as we were coming back across the Pacific, uh, all of the officers, all of the junior officers, had been reading this book about Pearl Harbor and the attack. All right, as we pull up over the horizon and we're just starting to get a radar picture, this, I was on an old ship. I mean, it had surface search and air search radar. The air search, I don't think it worked in 30 years, probably since Inchon or something. But uh, so we're getting surface search radar and we see Oahu sitting there and there are hundreds, literally hundreds of fast-moving, what appear to be air targets, showing up on radar. And I was junior officer of the deck at this point, and the OD goes, Captain to the bridge, which is announced all across the ship, and this is an emergency situation. The old man comes running out and says, What is going on? Looks over and goes, Holy cow, what is it? As we pulled closer, we saw that these were Japanese Zeros. I mean, they're like this, all over the place on Sunday morning into Pearl Harbor. And everybody's kind of like, <laughs> you know, what do we do now, coach? But uh, they were filming Tora, Tora, Tora. Uh, and so the, the rest of the cruise uh, was uneventful. Got back, went to Swift Boat School, met, met a bunch of guys, really nice, good people, some of the best. Went to Vietnam. Uh, well, I couldn't get a flight to Vietnam. I showed up at the appointed time. They said, the ah, flight's full. You can't go. I, okay. And I'm, I'm thinking I'm out here at McCord Air Force Base. I think that was it. Uh, and there's protesters outside. Stop the war. Stop it. And I'm in here trying to get a flight. It took me three days to get a flight. But, uh, you know, needless to say, landed in Saigon or in uh, Cameron Bay, which if you ever get the chance, it has the most beautiful beaches in the world. It is just idyllic. It looks like Bali, only nicer with cleaner water. All right, so open the doors of the aircraft and they, like all airplanes, and even in those days, it has slight overpressure inside. So you didn't really smell anything or notice anything as you got to the door to go down the ramp it was two things this blast of hot air all right in september uh and the smell 
it smelled like you'd been thrown into an open sewer. And the heat, and you kind of, <sighs> and everybody is going like, <sighs> like this and everything. But that, that was my first impression. So met the, uh, the guy who commanded our squadron. He said, you're all going to die, that kind of thing. And, you know, if you're feeling cowardly, uh, just raise your hand and I'll send you home, that sort of stuff. So found that I had been assigned to one of the divisions down in the Delta. We had uh, five or six divisions of uh, swift boats. Ended up going to Catlo, which is, oh, down the river, so to speak, from uh, Saigon. It's about, oh, 30, 40 miles maybe at the most but in what's called Vung Tau Harbor. And it's this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful bay about uh, probably two thirds of the way down the coast of South Vietnam. Uh, showed up there, they, you know, welcome aboard. Uh, I said, where's my crew? And they said, oh, they've been scattered everywhere. We need people and, you know, you'd be lucky if you ever see any of them again. So, okay, <laughs> fine, what do we do? And, so they said, well, you're going to ride with these, these three officers. And once they say you can go out, then we're going to find a crew for you and get you a boat. And I thought, hmm, well, this isn't exactly the way they said it, you know, back in school and everything, but uh, sounds good to me. So I remember there was a guy named Doug Miller, Bill Miller, and Tom Costarino were my three mentors. And there was a, a phrase, you don't get a boat till you've got your shit together. Pardon my French, of course. Uh, and they made darn sure that you didn't. They literally hammered you. It was worse than the, the first couple weeks at OCS with the chiefs and the nines and niceps, they called them. Uh, it, it was really bad, but in a good way because they wanted you to be able to do this right. And I thank those guys for just some incredible lessons in people and in, in boat handling and, and what to do with bad guys. So I finally got a crew without a leading petty officer. <clears throat> now you can imagine, you've all heard jokes about uh, second lieutenants and ensigns in the Navy and the Army and the Air Force and you know, all that stuff. Uh, what good is an ensign without a senior enlisted guy? Well, I didn't have one. I had a second class engine man who knew more about diesels than probably Detroit Diesel Division of General Motors. Uh, and he was my senior guy, but he, he wanted to just stay back by the engines. And we had a couple of practice drills, like setting general quarters and stuff. And I, you know, wait, where's Pappy? He's down in the engine room. Huh? You know, his position is here. Well, he didn't really want to do that. And so I finally talked to the division commander and said, you know, look, I need a good leading petty officer. And I got a guy, a first class quartermaster, who I will. I don't mean this as a negative about Ed. Uh, he had been very badly treated by the previous officer in charge that he had worked for for several months and was basically afraid to do anything on the boat. And I, after one patrol, I came back, took him up on the pier and said, look, this isn't going to work. Uh, either you're going to have to start acting like the senior guy on the boat or we're going to get another one and you can go and men charts somewhere. And he said, you mean you want me to kind of run things? And I said, I think you got it, Ed. Or West at that time. Those were still very formal days. And he ended up being just an incredible asset to me. One of the best people I've ever known in my life. We met uh, once after Vietnam. No, we met a couple times after Vietnam. And just a truly terrific guy. He had retired as a chief petty officer, uh, which I think I might have had something to do with, with the fit reps I gave him and that sort of thing. Uh, now, on to the boats. Uh, the boats were 50 foot uh, by 13 foot, 8 inches or something wide, aluminum, 
three-eighths inch aluminum. Uh, that's not a whole lot. The only metal on the boats were some of the fittings for gauges, uh, parts of the helmsman's chair, the engines. So if you really wanted to be protected, you would get down in the engine room in between these massive uh, V12s, uh, but you couldn't get down there. Uh, the rest of the boat was uh, shrapnel, just waiting for something to hit it. <clears throat> And that, that was the worst thing that could happen to you, was either shrapnel or a mine. But the rockets, the B-40 rockets, the famous B-40s uh, that everyone talks about, if they hit a swift boat, the whole end would be this big. There would be a hole this big on the other side. And uh, the shrapnel all had to go somewhere, and it usually found people. So we were all kind of concerned about that. Our, oh. Our patrols would last any three to four days. So we were unusual because we were up in the rivers of the Mekong Delta. My boat primarily was in the Basak River, which is the southernmost tributary. Okay, that's not a tributary, it's an outlet, whatever. <clears throat> Basak River is at, at its widest, somewhere around two miles wide. Uh, and it was the, a primary lane for, for bad guys. And they had had other boats in there, and they'd had the Ninth Army in there, and they had done a wonderful job of, of knocking a lot of this off. Uh, but they brought our boats in because, <clears throat> as a chief at headquarters told me later, Swift Boat can take a hit. And I thought, I'm glad I'm hearing this, you know, in 1995 or whatever it was. Uh, he said, the PBRs, if they took one hit, they, they were out of business. And the PBRs were the smaller, uh, what was that movie, but they were famous in that. Uh, and he said, swift boats can take a hit and you're shooting down most of the time. So they put them in the rivers. Uh, we didn't have any more armor than the the PBRs did or anything like that. We could carry troops. We did a lot of troop insertions. Uh, we shot a lot of what's called H&I fire, harassment and interdiction fire. How many troops could you carry at a time? <clears throat> Alive or dead? Alive. Uh, around 20. Okay, so about a platoon? Light, yeah. A light platoon? Yeah. Well, these were Vietnamese regional forces, popular forces, RFPFs, okay. Rough Puffs. Uh, and they didn't have big, huge packs and stuff like that. Yeah. So it wasn't that big of a crowd. They did have uh, almost 40 stacked on a boat who had not made it at one point. And I wouldn't have driven that boat, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, that was ugly. But so we did uh, the harassment and interdiction fire, which is shooting at night <clears throat> at uh, White House approved targets, apparently. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and we had other little things that people would assign us to do, usually out of their headquarters or something. Well, being a, an independent group of guys, I mean, these are all young lieutenants, junior grade, and a couple ensigns like me, although I made JG and threw the butter bars over the side. But uh, we, we got to where we would stop in to the naval advisors and the army advisory groups and say, what do you want to do? We're going to be here this long, and we can get, the, like in the Basak, we had three boats on patrol in about five-mile-long patrol areas. But we could get all three of them together and carry troops or do something, and so we'd set up our own operations, uh, not realizing that we probably weren't supposed to do that. Uh, after about two months on the boats, I got called into a meeting and our meetings were <clears throat> pretty heavy stuff. We had it in this little hooch that was set up as an O-club. And everybody, you know, we'd been playing AC Ducey or something, and, and 
I imagine quite a few beers were probably consumed, and one of the older guys, who shall remain nameless, said, well, for you new guys, and there were about six of us maybe that were newer, he says, we, we think it's time to initiate you guys. And we all, huh? And it was, uh, well, you've heard of the rules of engagement. Sure, yeah, yeah. And they said, well, you know, here's the rules of engagement that we operate under. Shoot them before they shoot you, if you can. Now, the rules of engagement at that point officially were, if you took fire, you had to call your Army or Navy counterpart on the beach. They had to call their Vietnamese counterpart on the beach, <clears throat> who had to then call the regional headquarters, or in our case, they could call right to Saigon find out who it was, blah, 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 and then call back down through the chain of command and say, okay, you can shoot back, or no, don't shoot back. How long might that take? I don't know. I never got permission. <laughs> I'm honest. I, I don't, but, I mean, just seeing how well other things worked, it, it probably was 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. And firefights in Vietnam were typically over in, I'd say, under two minutes in our case. Pretty active, two minutes. But uh, <clears throat> so uh, they said, you know, you'll you'll be the one explaining to a board of inquiries why your boat is no longer with us. You'll be the one explaining to the parents or wives of your crew that you've lost why they aren't there. So you take care of things, and this is how we do it. And the, everybody's like, hey, I'll drink to that. Uh, but that's, those were sort of our rules, and I don't think anybody abused that except for one person that I know of, only secondhand. But, uh, so we'd do these patrols, and uh, we'd, all these other things, we did medevacs, uh, which is where you pick up either an American or a VN, uh, even civilians. We did one that was absolutely heartbreaking. Two o'clock in the morning, uh, we were just kind of drifting down the Bosak River. We get a call from uh, the Army advisor, who we knew real well, and he said, I got a problem here. He says, I got this village, blah, 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 and he says, you were just there two days ago doing a, a Medicap, which is where you take the boat in and you've got a corpsman on board and you have the corpsman check everybody out and everything and you pass out stuff and you meet the kids. And he said, yeah, they're taking a bunch of crap and they've got VC on the ground in the village. And he said, can you get over there? And I just automatically said, yes. I mean, without even thinking about it. Well, I didn't have a cover boat. I didn't have air. I had absolutely nothing, and it's on a small island, well, small, probably a square quarter mile, in the middle of this river, and you had to pull in. It was kind of funny. It was almost like pulling into a little lagoon in this island, except everything was smaller. Mm -hmm. And we pulled in there probably about 2.15 in the morning, and what well, we did, didn't pull in, we got up close. And I was thinking, this is not a good idea. This is a really bad idea to go in there. And we turned sideways and shot a couple of illumination rounds up in the air with our 81 millimeter mortar. Now that's a pretty bright light. And we purposely shot them behind the island so as they came down that the island and any bad guys would be illuminated and we wouldn't be. Ha, pretty smart, huh? Uh, but so we got in, and the VC had left, and they had <clears throat> they had just beaten the village chief to death with a rice mallet. Now a rice mallet is a chunk of wood about this big around, probably two feet tall, with a huge handle on both sides, and you just go boom, boom, like that. His wife was forced to watch all this. Then they just shot her. Then they took his 11-year-old daughter and with a machete cut a chunk out of the back of her head. And 
I, I mean, we're here. This is so surreal. I mean, I'm standing on the bow of the boat, and this, this little mama son walks up to me. A mama son is an older woman, an older female. And she's holding this little girl, and she hands her to me. Like, what am I supposed to do? And I picked her up, and you could see, the, I mean, the hole in the back of her head was had to be that big. And most of the bone was gone, all of the skin. I mean, I don't know what could cause a human to want to do that to another human. But we took her on the boat. The village was kind of pacified. We had both other boats coming in. A spooky, uh, one of the DC-3s with miniguns had been called in. And they had incredibly bright spotlights and things. Uh, so the village was sort of secure. The bad guys apparently had all left. I sat on the back of the swift boat for probably 15 minutes, holding this little girl in my arms. And she would, I could feel her heartbeat most of the time. And we got up to this, it was a fairly good size, oh, I'm sorry, naval station, navy station, at a place called Bintui which is about three quarters of the way up the bus, up the Mekong system to Cambodia, and pulled in and a Navy lieutenant came down and said, uh, you're not supposed to be here, you know, or something like that. And I said, I got a wounded little girl that needs help. And he said, well, go over to that pier. And I said, no, you get a something or other corpsman right here now or get a doctor. And he said, you don't tell me what to do. And we had a, a gunner's mate who was about 6'2", and one of these guys like this, Joe Sandoval, is standing right behind me. And I said, Joe, throw this guy off the pier. And he said, what? And I said, I want a doctor now. Do you understand? And pretty soon, Vietnamese doctor comes running down. Now, Vietnamese doctors were used to snap decisions. I mean, and some were good, some weren't so good. Uh, he looks at the little girl and goes, Finny, Chetnam, Chetnam, which is, Finny is French, she's finished, Chetnam is, she's dead. Uh, and I looked at him, and, and we had a confrontation that you've probably seen or heard of in the movies, but this, I'm not kidding, this was real. I pulled a 45 out of my pocket holding this girl like this and Sandoval finally grabbed her from me and grabbed his hair and stuck the gun up under his chin and I said, you fix her now. Well, he went from not being able to speak any English to reciting Shakespeare in about 12 seconds. Uh, he couldn't have been more helpful, pick up the girl, you know, mm -hmm trundling off. I have no idea what he did with her after that. But And as <clears throat> two things came out of this, for me especially, uh, I hadn't really thought about the VC or the NVA and what were their motives and what were they trying to accomplish. This was absolute terrorism. At, you know, people get killed in war. That's, I mean, I never had any misgivings, and I'm sure you didn't, Roger, about pulling the trigger on a guy, you know, who was trying to shoot you, but this didn't have anything to do with that, especially this little girl. And I think that was the night that I just sort of changed. Uh, after, before that, I wanted to patrol and keep things safe, you know, do all that good, good Navy stuff. Uh, after that, I wanted to find VC and kill him. I didn't want to find him and rehabilitate him. I didn't want to find him and turn him over to the Vietnamese. I wanted to find him and kill him. That was my goal in life. And I think a couple of the crewmen, I can't speak for them, but I think a couple of the crewmen felt the same way. The second thing, and this didn't come until later in life, if if the VC had been in there still, and let's say there's 
12 VC had attacked this island and, and killed these people. Our only defense is 50 caliber machine guns. And if somebody had shot at us or fired a rocket at us, we would have leveled everything in sight. Because that was the only way we could. I mean, we're sitting on a, like an aluminum bathtub, mm -hmm. for Pete's sake. And I just, I realized at that point how blessed I've been my whole life that God has always been there. Even when I wasn't watching for him, he was always there and took care of us. There's, I could tell other stories, but you want to hear about when I came home? Uh, sure. <laughs> we were supposed to land in, what is it, Spokane again, I guess, McCord, mm -hmm. something. It was a big area for that. Uh, somehow, from in the middle of the flight from Japan to Spokane, we got uh, changed over to land at San Francisco, famous SFO. <clears throat> Neat airport. Uh, we landed eventually, and you know we're all in greens. I mean that's what you wore in Vietnam. You didn't have you know Sunday church clothes and stuff like that. Uh, so we land and we're taxiing along, and all of a sudden we're everybody's looking, and there there goes the terminal, and uh, we keep taxiing out this way, and finally we turned in. And we're asking the stewardesses, who were just super young women. I mean, they were the greatest. But we ask her, what's going on? She says, I think we're going to have to land up at their deplane up at the end here. And so, I mean, we're all just, you know, hey, we're back. I mean, get us off of this thing. Um, we got off. And this was all open boarding with the stairways and everything. And so we, we got off, and they, they put us into the basement of a wing of the main terminal. And nobody's thinking anything about it. And all of a sudden, the civilians come up and start yelling at us, dump all those bags and blah, 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 do this, do that, and everything. And I mean, I'm, I'm a seasoned lieutenant junior grade by this point. I mean, I have seen the war, you know, I have scalped Indians. I mean, jeez, I don't have to take this from these guys. And there were several senior enlisted and other senior, not other senior junior officers. That's, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. <clears throat> and so a couple of us stepped up and said, well, what do you think you're doing here? You know, you don't appear to be in my chain of command, and I know I'm not in yours, so what's your role here? And they said, well, we're the police, and we are going to inspect all of you. So we said, okay, there's, you know, probably a process for that. Where's the regular, you know, place that they do that? It's right here where we tell you. And they were these start, actually police in uniform? No, no, they okay. were. They were yeah. young guys, fit looking, but yeah. they said they were from Border Patrol or you yeah. know something like okay. that, in civilian clothes. And so they, a couple more of them came in, and they had about fifteen of them. I mean, of course, there were two hundred of us, but they run up and they start dumping duffels onto the floor. And again, we had this army captain, bless his heart, he stepped up and said, wait just a minute, get your boss down here. Well, I don't have to do anything you tell me. He said, you're going to get your boss down here, you're going to have two broken legs within 30 seconds. And this kid is all of a sudden like this, and so they finally get the guy down there. He calms everybody down, no more dumping on the ground and stuff, and a lot more civil. Okay, so then we go up and we have to wait in line and go through this whole immigration deal. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're a soldier returning from defending your country and you have to go through immigration. <laughs> I mean, you, okay, <clears throat> so then we go back down in the basement and everybody's like, well, what the hell's going on? Maybe they got a bus for us or something. So they say, okay, everybody this way. And they open this garage door-like thing that's about a oh, double size of a normal door, but much higher. And you look out and there's a concrete ramp that goes up and there's walls on both sides. And one of the guys 
I, uh, it was an army guy. I guess he'd been through this once before. He goes, oh, shoot, the, the gauntlet. And everybody, what's the gauntlet? And he said, just wait. And as you walked out, there were hippies lining both sides up on the tops of these walls, spitting rotten potatoes, I mean, tomatoes, anything they could throw, screaming, all this kind of stuff. And I looked over. We had a SEAL team. And they normally are very, very quiet, and they stay to themselves. But I knew them because I'd driven them around. And uh, they had a guy that was probably five foot four, whatever the legal minimum was. And they were getting ready to throw him up onto the top. And, I mean, it, it would have been awful. <laughs> so I walked over to him, said to this uh, first class that was in charge, I said, no, just don't do that. Just come on, please, don't. He says, I don't have to take this crap. And I said, yes, you do right now. You do. And finally, he calmed down. They all calmed down, and we kept walking out. But that was welcome home. Yep. Uh, after that, it was, you know, I went home to see my parents, uh, spent a couple days there, then reported to D.C., uh, for duty, ended up getting married, going to a destroyer after that. I stayed in about five years total. But then it was interesting because we all know that veterans are highly sought in the civilian workforce and that not only are you not discriminated against, but you get a little extra push, right? No. Yeah. Uh, once people found out you were a combat vet, the, you could sort of see the curtain coming down. At least that was my experience with several employers. I ended up uh, going to work for a company called West Vaco, which was a paper company back then. They've since merged hundreds of other companies. And the CEO and largest shareholder was a guy named David Luke. Now, David Luke was unique in that he was a uh, <clears throat> Navy fighter pilot in World War II and had shot down three zeros. <laughs> he kind of liked veterans, so they, it was a real good move. But we still, you know, it's still, we had funny things happen, like real estate. I was, uh, we moved to Detroit once, and the real estate agent and I don't know how it came up, but once she found out we were, or that I was a veteran, and, well, my wife's Chinese, so that could have been it, too, but she didn't show us in any of the areas where the, the regular people in our socioeconomic class lived. It was all, you know, way downtown. And I finally, you know, said, okay, you're fired. You know, got another one, and everything was good then, but... Uh, that was the only outright discrimination as a civilian former uh, Navy guy. But uh, I don't know. I always felt there was a little bit of tingling in the background. I just sort of... And now everybody loves it. So, all's well. <laughs> That's my story. Now, your experience in San Francisco is almost identical to mine, which was two weeks or before you came back. Oh, really? So, so I don't feel like you're the only oh, one. Okay. It's a common experience, unfortunately, and they just didn't do much about it. No. The uh, police there, just amazing what they stood back and watched. Yeah. It, uh, it was really surprising. But, uh, hmm. uh, tell us a little about your... Uh, your personal life then, your your wife and your your family. Well, I met my wife in D.C. when I was stationed at Bupers. Uh, she comes from a Navy family. Uh, her father and mother lived in Oahu on December 7, 1941. He enlisted uh, the day after the Pearl Harbor attack. Uh, retired as a, he was one of the first uh, E-9s when they finally moved up to that rate. And then worked as a budget analyst 
in Washington, D.C., in a couple of the budget shops and stuff like that. He was pretty well known around Bupers during those days as, you don't want to mess around with Joe Lum, because uh, he will have you. And uh, it was, all right, I'll tell this story. Uh, when I, when Chris and I decided we should get married, uh, I had to ask her dad before we could officially do this. So I'm sitting in their house with him in their basement family room, and I had just attempted to start a fire in the fireplace and let the damper close as just as it was getting going. And in walks Papa Joe from his day in the office. And I mean, it's just, you know, what the God. hello there, future father-in-law. You know, I'm burning your house down. I mean, uh, but so we we got all the smoke out. And so he and I are sitting there and he says, how about a beer? And that, that was his answer to everything. How about a beer? Uh, so we were having a beer and sitting there and I said, uh, you know, uh, Chris and I have been talking and we'd, uh, We'd really like to get married, but I want mm -hmm. your approval first on this. And you know, I was kind of old-fashioned and thought this would be a nice touch. And he just <laughs> and I finally—I mean, this was thirty seconds at least. I mean, it felt like hours. I thought he was going to keel over or something. He finally said, looks at me and says. What am I going to tell my friends? Now, his friends are all Navy chiefs, right? I mean, even the people he works with. That he recruits Navy chiefs. He has no use for officers. And I wasn't quite catching this yet, but uh, I said, what do you mean? He said, my daughter's going to marry an officer? <laughs> and I just went, oh boy, didn't see that one coming. <laughs> But so we got married anyway, and, and they were really nice people. Just enjoyed <laughs> enjoyed both of them. Uh, we had two kids. Oh, we moved seven times in the first ten years as civilians. Uh, we had two kids. Uh, son went to uh, the Naval Academy, now works for the FBI. Uh, he has four kids, including one adopted, which came as a shock. Uh, you can learn from your kids even uh, even when you think you know everything. It was uh, mm. it was real interesting. And Jack is just the neatest little guy. He's Chinese, which causes some interesting reactions from people. They see Chris, who's Chinese, then the kids, who are you know all mixed up, then Jack. Okay. You know, you can see the wheels turning with, how did they do that? <laughs> but, and then we have a daughter who went to Wake Forest, and she is a stay-at-home mom up in the D.C. area and has two kids who are both pretty neat. So that's what we do. I'm retired now for four or five years, I guess, and mm. just loving retirement. This is what I was born to do. <laughs> So. Oh, sounds good. I was curious about uh, one aspect of your operations on the swift boats. Uh, maybe you didn't call it a swift boat, but there it, your slow boat. <laughs> In uh, arriving at a shore with these 20 RFPFs, mm -hmm. uh, did you ever come under fire at that point? And if so, what was the response or what would it have been? It, it depends. We, we would occasionally, the, the VC and we occasionally would run into NVA down in the Delta because during the Tet Offensive, so many of the VC got, just got killed. Yep. But yeah. we would run into either VC or NVA. Uh, occasionally they would jump up and the, the beaches were strange. The rivers would flow and it wasn't unusual to have a 10 foot tidal drop. It wasn't even unheard of to have a 30-foot tidal drop. So some of the, the beaches were very steep and some you'd run into mud and the troops would have to go through the mud. But then you got up onto dry land and the, the bad guys, Chuck as we called him, would uh, dig holes in there. 
And sometimes they would pop up just as you were pulling in and kind of go, you know, or maybe two or three of them would do that. Then you could shoot back. That was, you know, you usually knew what was on mm -hmm. the other side. I mean, you weren't going to just shoot if there was, like, you know, a nursery over there or something. But, uh, it got more difficult as Chuck got smarter, and he would wait till the troops that we had landed passed him. And then he would stand up and shoot at us, hoping that we would shoot back trying to get him and mm -hmm. shoot our own troops. Yeah. Of course, that was like, <laughs> hey, you know, you think we're that dumb? But... Uh, that was that was the big uh, that was the the hardest part always. I mean, is the getting in and getting out. I mean, you were very vulnerable. The boat itself would be, let's see, four four or so feet up off the water or off the mud or off the beach. Mm -hmm. If if you were real lucky, you got to land now on solid ground. You got real lucky about once every thirty fifth time, I think. <laughs> Other than that, you would push the bow in under the edge or into mud. Mm. And I have some good pictures of, you know, troops jumping off the boat and like this up, yeah. up to their knees in mud. Uh, and then you'd have to maneuver around and try to get the cargo net over to them so they could mm. grab onto that and pull up and stuff. But then when they got back on the boat, if they had to go through mud or if they were down low, they had to climb up a cargo net to get onto the boat. Well, while they're doing that, you're just sitting there. I mean, you can't, even your bow gunner, who has an M60 machine gun, uh, is just, he can't start shooting because they're coming up right in front of him, literally. I mean, maybe this far away, you'd see him coming up over the bow. And the, the twin gunner, the 50 cal, up on the top, uh, usually couldn't depress the barrels far enough to shoot at that point because, you know, the boat as it comes in would go up a little bit. So you were pretty vulnerable then. Yeah. Yeah. That's the price you pay to play the game. Yeah. My battalion was in the Delta before I got there and I heard all the tales of the mm. troubles they had, which included an unusual cause of death, drowning, trying to cross Rivers with 70 pounds on your back can make it a little bit of a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was, I think, the biggest cause of death uh, for about four months with my huh. battalion. That was the 9th out of Mito? Sorry? The 9th out of, 9th Army out of Mito? 199th. 199th. Okay. We were out of Kanjuk. Okay. Yeah. I, we didn't work with American troops so much. Matter of fact, we heard on uh, AFVN one afternoon. AFVN is the local or the all Vietnam radio station. Yeah. Uh, we heard on there one afternoon that there were no combat troops left in the Delta area. Oh. We were just thrilled to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Big gunner's mate says, I'm going home, boss. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It was... Uh, I don't know. Do you have any other questions or anything? What about uh, reunions? Do you have any? Starting in 1995, uh, we have had one every two years. And I was very active in the, what we called the Swift Boat Sailors Association, which was had nothing to do with the political group. And we took great pains to distance ourselves uh, from that. Uh, we would do things... Uh, not unlike AVVBA, but because we're all spread out. I mean, we had mm -hmm. 800 and some members spread out all over the country, a couple still in London and other places. But <clears throat> we, we were a little bit more limited in what we could do. Uh, we did do some neat things. We found a PCF hull up in Bremerton, Washington, sitting in a Navy scrapyard and asked the Navy if we could have it, arranged for a mm -hmm. trailer and truck to bring it down. What was funny is the guy who found this for us was an active duty Navy commander whose father was the maintenance officer for our entire squadron. Hmm. <laughs> and he's flying in one day and looked down and says, that looks like one of those boats Dad used to. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, and that is now on Coronado in a park uh, with a PBR and a, one of the, uh, I forget what they call it, monitors or something. I could never keep all those things straight. The heavily armored, real slow uh, river deals. But it's in a park in, in mm -hmm. Coronado that is used for all kinds of neat things. And it's all built by veterans, totally. Uh, we've spent thousands as an organization. We have a boat in Washington, D.C. that is owned by the Navy, and we try to influence them to do nice things to it, but, I mean, they come up with costs. We painted the boat in Coronado. Uh, I think it cost us 8000 bucks. We wanted to paint the boat in D.C., and it was going to cost $58,000. <laughs> And we said, huh? And they said, well, it's Navy. You have to encapsulate the entire area because of red lead. We go, well, how much is that? Because we can save all that. This is a swift boat. It's made out of aluminum. If it has red lead on it, you wouldn't have a swift boat by now because <laughs> the red lead is a metal and it reacts with the aluminum. And they said, well, it doesn't matter. This is, you know, the government of D.C. And then you have to have protective masks and every, all this stuff. So, but we finally got a Congress critter to uh, join on our side, and he embarrassed the Navy into painting it. So <laughs> it looks a lot better now. And the neatest thing that we have done, and I was chairman uh, when this happened, was I got a call one day from one of our guys. He said, I was just talking to that guy over in Malta. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. And it's uh, a, a guy named Ivan Consiglio. And he's a Maltese uh, Armed Forces of Malta guy, but he's Navy Armed Forces of Malta. And he said, you know, they, they've got those two swift boats over there, and uh, they're getting rid of them. They're going to decommission them. And he says he thinks we might be able to get one of them. I said, those things, they're still operating, aren't they? He said, yeah. <laughs> I said, okay. And so another guy and I, two weeks later, headed for Malta <laughs> and met with all these people of Armed Forces of Malta. The guy that was with me ended up going back three times. Uh, and he got to be buddies with this lady who was the, like, Secretary of Defense in Malta. And she even went to San Diego to see the boat out there once. But we finally got them to agree to gift the Swift Boat Sailors Association this boat. And I got this registered letter one Saturday morning, and I thought, hey, what is this? You know, huh? It's probably some pictures. And I started to toss it you know, to open it later, and I thought, oh, let me look. <laughs> it's from Vanessa, what was her last name, but saying we'd like to gift this boat mm -hmm. to your association. That was at the same time we found out that our former secretary treasurer had allowed our incorporation, our tax-free status, everything else to lapse. Uh, so they couldn't give the boat to us. We realized that. Immediately went to the Maritime Museum in San Diego and said, look, we've got a swift boat. It's up in the air right now. <laughs> uh, would you like it? And we will help you support this thing. Mm -hmm. And all. That. And they said, we would love to have it. Yeah. So now if you go out to San Diego, you see the Maritime Museum. It's right in front of what used to be the old Holiday Inn on the bay. You see the Russian sub and the big ferry, and there's a swift boat there that you can ride. Mm -hmm. It's really neat. Uh, the guy that, uh, it was crazy. We had a Navy ship, an LPD, uh, which is a huge ship, kind of like a mini aircraft carrier, had agreed the, naval atta the U.S. Naval Attaché in Malta had contacted the Navy arranged an unscheduled port tour, port stop, 
this ship was going to come in, pick up the swift boat, deliver it to the amphib base wow. in Norfolk, and we were going to have it trucked across country. Well, <clears throat> that was fine. They had the, the cradles designed. We paid for them. Uh, they had everything welded on the deck of this LPD. And some Navy captain, <clears throat> attorney type, in Norfolk got a hold of it and killed the deal. I mean, they had the swift boat literally in the cradles with the crane on the barge over here was starting to lift it when we got the word to stop. So we, we were very fortunate. We've had a couple guys in the group have done very well in life and they liked the group. They said, okay, what's it gonna take? And so we had it brought back commercially and then we hired this truck driver who ended up being one of the coolest people. He specializes in hauling large boats on this super long gooseneck trailer. And we ask him, if we give you some names, could you call these guys, you know, when you're close to one of these towns and stuff? And he said, sure, no problem, no problem, and everything. So I get a call on a Saturday morning. Hey, this is so-and-so, I forget his name. He says, I'm, I'm driving down uh, I-20 right now. And he says, I got a swift boat chasing me. <laughs> and we had a hilarious conversation. He says, I'm going to pull in at this place over here in Conyers. Uh, do you or anybody want to come look at this boat? And I said, I'll round up a crowd as fast as I can. So I got three other Swifties in town. And we all went out and looked at this thing. And, of course, it stripped down and everything and didn't look too good. But pretty soon we got about 80 or 100 people in this parking lot in Conyers. All of, what's that? You know, and so we're explaining it to them. And the bus drivers, he's walked off to get some coffee and stuff. But we just had a ball with that. And we finally got it out to San Diego and turned it all the way over. And it's running every day now. Uh, good story. Yeah. But we've had a lot of fun over the years doing different things. I probably ought to ask Tony and Sue if we have any questions there. Sue's got Navy connections. I have two quick questions <clears throat> for you. Okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> what was your take on the RFPF troops that you would... What, what are your thoughts about that? About, about what kind of people they were? What were your interactions with them? These, uh, the Rough Puffs, uh, were people who'd been fighting one way or the other for over 20 years. That's an entire generation. Uh, they didn't know anything else. Some were very aggressive. Uh, some really just, they were in it just so they didn't have to put on a regular uniform, I guess, and jump out of airplanes and things. Uh, some were good, some were bad. But uh, it usually <clears throat> it usually went along with, this is, I hope I don't hurt any feelings, but it usually went along with the quality of the advisors they had. For instance, we had uh, a Navy advisor, didn't have rough puffs, but he had some uh, junk guys. The, the Vietnamese Navy ran a small junk fleet. And they were sort of like rough puffs, but a lot more official. Uh, the Army advisors would have two, three, four groups of rough puffs. Uh, if it was a squared away Army officer, they'd be squared away rough puffs. If it was some guy who, and we had them in the boats, not many, but, you know, who just, they were there for whatever reason, uh, they weren't squared away. I, you know, given the situation in Vietnam, I'm not sure what any of us would have done on that. We did turn over <clears throat> our boat, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to a Vietnamese crew, and I had no question in my mind at all that these were good people. Uh, they were Vietnamese regular Navy, uh, good people. 
they took I'm sure they took care of that boat so and the last question you've alluded to some of it you've described some of the of the crew positions but if you could mm. tell okay. us about uh, you know the swift boat what are the crew position how many crew members what did they do okay you typically had five crewmen and then usually we had a Vietnamese uh, interpreter or maybe two Vietnamese uh, the second one training we were seemed like we were always trying to train somebody to do something or well that's a whole different story uh, <clears throat> There was the, going from the so-called top-down, uh, officer in charge. Uh, this was similar to a commanding officer, but only about half uh, the prerequisites and capabilities and things like that. You were not a commanding officer. Uh, then you had a leading petty officer, and this was usually a first-class uh, E6 or, in some cases, an E5. And they would be sort of like the second in command. Then you had an engineman, and that could be, there were some E2s and E3 enginemen, believe it or not. Uh, you had a gunner's mate, and that was usually a rated guy. Uh, gunner's mate first, or gunner's mate second or third. All right, E4, E5. Uh, and then you had uh, a ra radar man. And he was supposed to take care of the radios and all that stuff and the radar and basically if it sparked and you know buzzed he he took care of it uh, but that was pretty much it and we all had positions on the boat for general quarters and we all knew what to do if this happened we used to do drills like that all the time you know, like if, if Wallace gets shot and goes over the side, which <clears throat> fairly typical, unfortunately, or just goes over the side, because the, the officer in charge would stand in the pilot house on the port side in a doorway where you could see outside this whole port side. And the helmsman would sit on the helm chair right behind here and have access to the controls and the throttles and everything like that. You had a gunner's mate right up here on top of you through uh, an open gun tub with a pair of twin 50 caliber machine guns. Uh, so, you know, the officer in charge didn't take Chuck long to figure out, you know, who would be a good guy to shoot if you had a chance. <laughs> you either get the guy up there with the twins or you get the, you know, kind of goofy looking guy in the doorway. <laughs> But, uh, and that's why you didn't wear uniforms. I mean, you wore, we wore greens all the time, but you know, that was. But if you had a Vietnamese, they usually had a, a spot. Uh, general quarters, let me see where everybody was. Oh, you had your radarman was up in the bow and what they called the peak tank, which was a watertight compartment with a, a hatch on it. And that's where you kept your anchor line and stuff like that. But it was big enough to stand in, and you could mount an M60 machine gun up there, so that gave you one more machine gun. And then on the stern, you had the 50 cal on top of the 81 millimeter mortar on a recoil mount, which was really cool. Uh, you could direct fire it, in other words, get the mortar like no click, like bang, it would shoot. Uh, or you could shoot it traditionally where you drop the mm -hmm. round in. Uh, then just forward of that, right aft of the main cabin, uh, you could have M60s mounted on either side. And that's usually where you had the VNs, the Vietnamese, if you had them or mm -hmm. if you had an extra person. But, uh, yeah, we got some interesting extra people. I mean, the press people, we didn't like them. I mean, I didn't like them. I told them, you can come with me because I was ordered to take you, but you sit on the mortar box on the stern. Don't bother anybody. I mean, I wasn't going to talk to them, and none of the crew wanted to talk to them. We had, <laughs> this was almost funny, we had a couple of midshipmen from the Naval Academy, summer crews, hmm. and uh, they come down, and of course they're wearing their <sighs> khakis then, thank heaven. But uh, 
And combination covers, the big, you know. And they want to go out with us. And the div Divcom pulls me aside and he says, don't let them get hurt. Don't let them fall over. If anything happens to them, I will personally shoot you between the eyes. You know, everything. You know I was more scared of that. So we go out and we're, we're heading out really into Vontau Bay because that was, I mean, that was safe. The ambassador used to go fishing out there and have martinis on the, the back end of a lot of swift boats. But so we took them out there, and as we're going out, you're passing these little inlets and things. And you look, and here's all these people fishing. And one of the midshipmen <coughs> says to me, Oh, fishing must be a big hobby around here. <laughs> uh, Mr. Jones, uh, that's how these people live. <laughs> that's dinner. <laughs> you know, but uh, no, they, I mean, they were good guys. But uh, it's just that's here are military people, and they didn't quite get it. And thinking back on that, what were average civilians in the United States thinking about all of mm -hmm. this then? Interesting. Yep. Rumor was the Viet Cong <coughs> used the uh, Vung Tau area as their R and R. Also, any truth ah, to that? Great story. <laughs> oh. We finally made it over to the beach on a Sunday morning. See, we patrolled usually, you were out for three or four days, sometimes five, and then you were back in for a couple and then you go back out. Uh, we had heard about the beach at Vung Tau. I mean, we've been over to Vung Tau. It was a great little town. But uh, went down to the beach and it was a hot, sunny day, nice beach. There was a squadron of OV-10 Broncos that the Navy had that were stationed in Vung Tau. And we knew a lot of those guys because they flew air support for us a lot and we actually picked one of them up once. <clears throat> the Broncos are a fixed wing? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Air Force used them for reconnaissance. The Navy loaded them up. They could carry six uh, combat troops fully loaded they could carry their own weight in bullets and missiles, and they could mm -hmm. uh, just over Mach 1 in a dive. <laughs> yeah, I think some so, of them were used to mount mini guns. Oh, they had mini guns. They had 20 millimeter minis. The 20 mm -hmm. millimeter Gatling gun. Yeah. Uh, they carried five inch Zunis. Matter of fact, when they finally got the Zunis, one of them fired one about 10 yards off the side of my boat. Whoops. <laughs> I mean, we were covered in mud and branches <laughs> and everything. I'm yelling at the guy, and he says, oh, I forgot to tell you. you know, but, no, so we're at Vung Tau, and we're, we're laying out on the beach and having a beer, you know, and everything. And here comes, in the distance, the OV-10s coming from the south up the beach at about, oh, probably 75, 100 feet. All the Americans are up, ah, oh, look at that, neat. All the Vietnamese are like this. All the VC are headed back to the dunes. <laughs> it was so funny. I mean, I had heard stories that this was what happened, but it really did. I mean, about half the males on the beach got up and ran back into the dunes. Yeah, it was a VC or an R area. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and there were I don't think there were very many service people of any kind ever harmed in Vong Tau. Yeah. Because the rule was, you leave us alone, we leave you alone. Yeah. You know, because we'd go in there. We had a famous French or a favorite French restaurant, and uh, we used to love that place. I mean, it was run by it was run by a Chinese guy, and we kept trying to get him to take over the war because we figured he'd have it making money within a year. But uh, no, it was a great restaurant. Yeah, mm. it's still there, I think. I've got to ask you one more question. Uh, you've got a Bronze Star Valor to your credit. Uh, you want to tell us about that? I'd, I'd really like to complain about the metal system in Vietnam. I, the Bronze Star that I was awarded, I basically told them I didn't want, they could keep it. Uh, the one that I felt I earned, well, I felt I earned two or three of them. 
but uh, we're all shot down in Saigon. So it's in my shadow box, but it represents something else. That's, they were passing out medals like candy. Yeah. So that's, that's my story. Well, that kind of puts a cork in it. Uh, want to give us any final thoughts with regards to what it means to serve and how, what you might say to others who are thinking about it? I, you know, I have, having a son that went through the Naval Academy and meeting a lot of his friends and things like that from that group, uh, it's, it's strange. We, this divide we have in our country is, it's just getting worse and it'll continue to get worse because such a huge part of our population doesn't have anything at stake. Uh, back when we had the draft, uh, and I mean, I, I went through OCS, okay, a lot better than being drafted, right? Well, probably. I mean, you know, you were an officer. You got to eat off tablecloths occasionally. Uh, but, but when you were going through it, you didn't care if the guy next to you was polka dot. I mean, he was the guy who could either pull you or you'd pull to get across the line. Uh, so race relations... You know, doing away with the draft, I think that set us back 50 years at least. Uh, having, having skin in the game, no, nobody knew what it was that you were doing out there until you, until you got there. And all of a sudden you carried a dying little girl in your arms. Mm. You, you spent three days at general quarters in a rice paddy basically looking for a down flyer. Uh, you do things like that and you realize, you know, th this is the way people should be. And, and what have we done? Just what's happened to us that we don't have this anymore? I mean, when I was a kid growing up, when you were kids growing up, people didn't act the way they do now. They knew why they were there. They knew what was at stake. Even if, I mean, my dad tried to uh, join the Navy several times. He once got in a direct commission as a lieutenant for two days, and he worked for U.S. Steel as a med engineer, and U.S. Steel grabbed him and said, you're not going in the Navy, yeah. Wallace. <laughs> you know, like, I even have a picture of him wearing dress blues. But uh, even if you didn't serve, even if you didn't serve active duty in a war, you knew there was something else that you were part of. I don't know. That's... The warrior's lament. Okay, sir. Well, I think we've had quite a interesting interview here. I uh, appreciate your contribution to the Veterans History Project and uh, want to thank you for your time. You're very welcome. And thank thank you. you for the time. Thank you for your service and welcome home. Yep. All right.